We now begin with our opening keynote. I am a little bit uh, worried about this opening keynote, to be perfectly honest. Um, this gentleman is not known for his, shall we say, uh, sanity. He has um, been a friend of mine for a long time. Uh, I'm not so sure that that will extend into the future once you understand this talk. And I do want to say that this is not, Google is not responsible for this man. <laughs> Google is not responsible for what he says. These are his opinions. So I wrote this. I hope he hasn't edited. You haven't put in something else. Oh, uh, he did put in something else. But he thinks that this is the way of the future. Now, if we can only find him, he has been missing for quite some time. Hopefully, my voice will be heard and Alberto Savoia will appear. This is the end. This is the end, my only friend, the end of our elaborate lives, the end of everything that stands, the end, no saint. Thank you very much. I'm afraid I have some uh, bad news. See, about a month ago, this Alberto Savoia character posted something on the Google testing blog announcing the test is dead and that he is the executioner. Well, I'm the only executioner. So I had no choice but to take Alberto out a little bit before his time. He doesn't really have clean living. However, since I took him out before his time, I asked him, I could grant him a little wish. And his first wish was, well, I would like to embrace Jessica Alba before I died. <laughs> he didn't say embrace, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but you get the idea. <laughs> so I told him, Alberto said, a little crappy wish. I mean, Jessica Alba is so out of your league, it's not even funny. So can you ask me for something smaller? And he said, you know, I committed to doing this presentation at GTAC. Uh, last year they asked me, but it was somewhere in India, and frankly, I couldn't be bothered to take the trip uh, for an invitation-only conference. And so I, I just did a crappy little five-minute video for them. But this year, I accepted to be a keynote speaker, and if I don't do it, they're stuck with the likes of James Whitaker. <laughs> so uh, I told him, OK. I was hoping it was the TED conference, but uh, GTAC sounds small enough and crappy enough, so I decided to grant him uh, his wish. So with that in mind, uh, the, this is the new uh, opening slides. I am the Grim Reaper. I, I've had a pretty bad reputation, so I'm trying to, be, to modernize, and uh, I'm trying my new hip-hop name, Da GR, uh, which I think is going to be a little bit more uh, successful. Now, in uh, 1882, Nietzsche wrote these famous words, God is dead. These words were not particularly well received in some uh, quarters, uh, in some particular quarters. <laughs> uh, and about 12 years later, I had to take Nietzsche out. And uh, by the time, it was kind of mentally insane, suffering from complication due to syphilis. But you don't really want to know the details. The point is that you know, anybody that says that something is dead will have to deal with me sooner or later, and usually sooner. So this Alberto character now comes and tells us this test is dead. Let's see what he actually has to say, what he had to say, sorry, uh, before about it. So here's a quick outline. 
We're going to start with the Old Testament ality. Uh, I said it would be a presentation of biblical proportions. Uh, then talk about the New Testamentality, why there has been this change, and then so what. And now if you excuse me, this thing is very, very hot. Uh, I, I assume human form, so you wouldn't be too repulsed. Um, <laughs> all right, let's talk about the Old Testamentality. In the beginning, there was a requirements document. Who, who remembers requirements document? Yeah. Anybody over 30? Yes. <laughs> now, the requirement documents was literally carved in stone, uh, and you didn't mess with it, you know. Get busy or look busy. Um, and the requirement documents begat the specification, the specification begat the design and the documentation, the design and the documentation begat the test plan, the test plan began the test suite, and the test suite begat the bugs. And as we like to say, there was much weeping and gnashing of teeth. It wasn't, it wasn't really a funny way of doing things. So in the Old Test mentality, things were very, very top down. They came from the top. And at some point, the split between developers and testers. And the two didn't meet until the test uh, crashed heads. What happened? Oh, crashed heads with the, uh, uh, with the code. And we got the bugs. Now, all of this happened at a glacially slow pace. Weeks, months, sometimes years. The cycles were painfully, uh, painfully slow. And there were artifacts out of this that, who, who, who knows what this is? These are horrible <laughs> constructs, right? Uh, you had per charts, and uh, per charts had sub per charts. Everything was organized this way, and you were supposed to follow. Now, no, no, I never made a per chart that anyone actually followed. So actually, my f name for this is the road to pert uh, you know, uh, I, I wonder if Twitter has any pert chart. Uh, now, and let's talk about testing. Testing, in the Old Test mentality, what happened is the companies hired one, two, three, four developers, and then they realized, well, we need some testing. They didn't do it themselves. So they hired, typically, a QA person. They noticed the upstairs, downstairs, you know. They were separate but unequal. And, uh, and so that's how testing went. They just tossed crappy code over the wall and uh, called every bug a feature. So that's all part of the old test mentality. So in summary, the old test mentality was top down, thou shalt follow the spec. It was rigid, thou shalt not deviate from plan. And we had distinct roles and responsibility. Developers shall developers, and testers shall test, and never the twain shall meet. And finally, there was this very strange attitude that we didn't release software until somebody said that it was ready to be released, right? Don't release, don't sell no wine before it's time. So actually, QA had some power, or at least on, uh, uh, on paper. Well, some people call this the waterfall model. As I said, a lot of people didn't like it. You know, it kind of got them into a lot of trouble. Uh, some they call it water fail um, <laughs> model. And it led, people want the change. So they came up with this new change, the New Test mentality. Now, in the New Test mentality, yeah, it's, it's the same number of fingers, and there's still a finger being pointed, but it's in the different direction, and it's a different finger. So we, we, we kind of flip the bird to authority. We say, no, 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 don't tell me what to write. We decide what, uh, uh, what to write. And so w whereas the Old Test mentality had kind of these principles, you know, focusing on building things right, the New Test mentality kind of just threw that away and came up with this different set of principles. So cycles became very fast, you know, days, weeks, sometimes minutes. Um, we launched software before it's ready. Now, you may have heard this quote, actually, a working group where, where this is actually the mandate. You know, yeah, you're embarrassed, you think it's not ready, perfect, we shall ship it now. Now, this did lead to some problems. Uh, sometimes software got out the door with some little toilet paper stuck on its foot, but that was okay because it all paid off in the end in what actually uh, mattered. 
And let's talk about the role of QA in this New Test mentality. Remember the old model? Well, the first thing that happened is that the role of tester was minimized, outsourced, offshored, and sent somewhere in the ether. And they used the extra resource to say, let's hire one new developer. Of course, they knew that this sounded a little bit irresponsible, so they made little excuses and they said, well, you know, you see this barrier between developer and testers? We're just going to burn it, and we're going to ask developers to take responsibility for testing uh, their code. Some testers did, some testers don't, some did a lot, some, uh, some did a lot, some did a uh, little. Uh, now, how many of you are surprised by what you've heard so far? How many people went, oh my God, I've never thought this, my career is in trouble, what's happening? How many people have been under the rock for the last five years? Nobody? Okay, good. So this is not the reaction I expect to get from you. In fact, I respect kind of a snooty reaction, something like this. Hey, Alberto. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, Death. Uh, you just described agile software. What's so new here? Boring. Uh, well, not quite. Because you see, I read the books, and then I go and look at how things are practiced, and the two things are very, 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 very different. So let's look into that. I call it actually the post-agile movement, to be polite. I mean, in other words, but I decided I didn't want it on the slide. So, Post-Agile has a much different and laissez-faire attitude about uh, testing. And for those of you who are not colloquial in French, here's what laissez-faire means. Casual, sloppy, careless, carefree, procrastinative. In other words, uh, in post-Agile, people don't give a shut door about testing uh, in general. Some people, you know, it, it, it's, they call it Agile, but what they do is actually much more freer than uh, Agile. Some people have called it fragile. Which, is a, uh, which makes a lot of sense, because definitely the artifacts are, are fragile. The question is, why? why? Why did we go down this path? There are two reasons. Uh, sorry, and, and by the way, what's the problem with, test with the old test mentality? You know, after all, a lot of great working software was built that way with the old test mentality. And the problem, sorry, the answer is because we can. No, with the, in the past, if you build a piece of software, you have to put it on a floppy disk, then later in a CD-ROM, and you package it, and if you had to make changes, it was a really painful process. Now, with this uh, web development, I believe this thing is called the information superhighway. You know, I, I, I'm not very busy here. We, we can just release things very quickly, and it's more fun, and we move faster. But I believe that there is a much deeper and more important reason. And the reason is that it's not a software quality issue that you are trying to address. It's an issue of building the right it versus building it right. And I will explain uh, a bit more for this. The thing is that when people move from this waterfall model to this fragile, post-agile uh, model, they had some stunning successes despite paying little or no attention to testing, any kind of testing, functionality, scalability, security, uh, you name it. Now, actually, I'm not going to name it. Uh, I think I may get in enough in trouble for this talk. I mean, I mentioned uh, Nietzsche, uh, Syphilis, New Testament, God, Old Testament. So I I'm not going to get into more trouble by naming some of the people and companies behind these quotes, but uh, you can trust me, these are bona fide. I may have paraphrased them because I didn't remember them literally. Now, these quotes come from people and companies that are among the most influential, wildly successful, and world-changing companies. These are the companies where a lot of you work or would love to work. So he, let's see what some of these people have to say about testing in this post-agile model. Here's one, uh, 250 developers and three testers. So how's that for a tester to developer ratio? But actually, in the big scheme of things, this is pretty good because there are some other companies where they just say, we do not hire testers. Uh, the, one of the reasons I'm giving is that for us, quality is secondary to speed and probably lower than that. Why, why do they think that? They think that testing slows you down. You know, testing, tests, even if they're well written, they require a lot of maintenance and a lot of uh, work. So the, the theory is that, look, by the time somebody has us well-tested software with our crappy software, we have millions of users. Guess who wins? It's pretty obvious. Now, the, the ex 
And finally, you've heard the quote, quality is free. Well, apparently some people think quality is not free. Quality is very, very expensive in ten, terms of time and effort. So but now you're saying, OK, that, that's about the, the old kind of testing, where you hire QA, hire QA and you separate it. Uh, people are stopping to do that kind of testing. And instead, what they're doing is unit testing, developer testing. Well, they're saying that they're doing it. But when you actually go and look under the cover, you come up with expressions like this, you know, from managers of uh, developers. I think our developers do some unit tests. So you think. Uh, when tests keep failing, we delete them. <laughs> I may have done that myself once or twice. Or, or uh, just say, I want to go home. So and sometimes you engage, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, we run automated tests. Uh, and ask it, well, what's the coverage? And this is an actual bona fide answer that I got from a person that would not be medium. <laughs> I say, OK, yeah. <laughs> I think you get the point. So, uh, and I want to emphasize, this is not just some rickety, rickety little startup somewhere in, 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 in some no-name place. This is in Silicon Valley, some of the most influential, wildly successful, and world-changing company. This is the post-agile uh, attitude. A lot of mouth, uh, you know, a lot of people speak about testing, but how people do actually do it. Now, you have to ask, well, aren't these people worried about bugs? And yeah, a little bit. But the real bugs that they're worried about are not the bugs that you know. They're worried about what I call idea bugs. So when you, typically, when we talk about bugs in the code, we, mean about, we talk about the wrong behavior for a product. Can anyone guess what an idea bug is? How is it defined? The wrong product. Exactly. So if the little innocent code bug, this is what a code bug looks like. You know, it may pinch you in the butt, leave you a little pimple. But this is, this is what the idea bug <laughs> looks like, right? The idea bug is actually, I can take him. I, actually, here, here it is. You, know, you recognize, uh, I took care of the uh, idea bugs. Uh, but idea bugs will kill you. They will kill your company. So no wonder that they're worried about that. Uh, and let's look a little bit at this concept of idea bugs. Where, where are they born? When somebody has an idea for a product, this idea is born in a place I like to call Thoughtland. So in Thoughtland, you have an idea, and you tell your idea to people, and what you get back is opinions. Now, ideas are abstract. Opinions are abstract and subjective. So you don't have much to go on, right? And this leads to, to some horrible, horrible problems. And I'm going to give you two examples. First of all, in Thoughtland, every idea can be a winner, even the lamest idea. Who remembers Webvan? Right. OK. For those of you who didn't, at the head of the bubble, uh, when internet bubble, when the internet came out, Webvan had this brilliant idea. People would order groceries online, and it would be delivered to their door within a 30-minute window. And they presented this idea to a lot of people, and everybody seemed to like it. I mean, even Borat. <laughs> nice. Uh, so based on that, they went to venture capitalists, and they raised uh, $100 million or more. They took that money, they built, you know, spent a lot in the website, they built a refrigerated warehouse, they bought a lot of van, they bought a lot of food, they stuffed it, and then they launched it. And how many people here regularly use web van or at-home grocery delivery? One per, well, a handful of people. So clearly, there is a small market for you, but definitely not the market that web van was expecting. So if you look on Wikipedia, web van is listed as a poster child for the bubble bursting. So, but in Idealand, it sounded like such a great idea. So Idealand can lead you to false positives. Now, something even worse happens in Idealand is that some great ideas are killed. Now, how many people here, the first time you heard about Twitter, thought that it was a crazy idea, that it would never work? Yeah, a lot of you. I, and some people still probably think, I don't understand how it works. So when, when they presented it to people, they told them, you got to be crazy. And what's with these 140 character limits? You know, you got to send photos. You know, you got to send attachment. And uh, everybody told them, no, well, we know what actually happened, right? Uh, Twitter is not only wildly successful, it's changing the world. It's changing politics. It's changing uh, things that we never imagined. So in a, but in idea land, it sounded like a loser to a lot of people. So the problem that you get in idea land, sorry, I over, the problem you get in idea land is that you never know if an idea is good or bad. 
until you actually build it. And let me, let me tell you, how many people here have worked at startups that poured their heart and soul to build and test a product and that startup failed? Okay, quite a few. The, re the rest of you, you're young enough. It will eventually happen if you don't <laughs> pay attention to this. So I call it the innovator's nightmare. Uh, I worked at several startups. Uh, the one where we actually spent the most time, you may have heard of it, Agitar, five years, we built this beautiful product, we tested the wazoo out of it, and yet it did not work. Uh, the way I like to summarize it, we spent $25 million of venture capital to sell $24 million worth of software. And you know, that equation doesn't quite uh, work. But Matt, did we test it well? Yes, we, it was a beautiful tested product. But the key is, if you really want to test something, and this is the key of the New Testament mentality, you have to test the idea. I'm not saying that you don't want to eventually build it right, but you have to make sure that you're building the right it. And you need to test the idea because just like code, it's very hard, the first piece of code works right, and that's why we test it. You have to be aware of the law of failure. Most products fail in the market. You probably heard it, 95% of all uh, mobile apps fail, four out of five startups fail, restaurants, I mean, this is true in every business. We have a lot of ideas that sound good, but eventually, the goal, failing. Now, here's a corollary that applies uh, to us. Most products fail in the market even if they're very well implemented or tested. Even if you do all the right things, the idea, if it's not the right idea, fails. And there, let, let me tell you, there's nothing more uh, upsetting than having a beautifully tested product, then you launch it and nobody uses those features that you spend so much time uh, testing. So. Idea bugs are like weeds, bad ideas come up all the time, and the question is, is can we actually test idea bugs? By the way, this is, uh, Al Alberto was going out of testing the traditional, he's now into still in another testing area, and that's idea testing, and hopefully you will find this relevant. So Alberto came up with this word called pretotyping, and that is testing the, as cheaply and as quickly as possible to make sure that you're building the right it before you're building it right. Now. This is a boring definition. Let me give you a couple of examples to drive the point home. About 30 years ago, IBM had tremendous computer technology. It was also in the typewriter business. Remember, 30 years ago, managers didn't type, no. Right? They had stenographers and they had the secretaries doing the typing. So they thought, wouldn't it be great if you could just speak into a computer and without a keyboard and you have stuff happens? 30 years ago, computers were not fast enough, 4.7 megahertz. Uh, and somebody thought, yeah, but if we solve this problem, if we build this product and we make sure it works well, we'll make a lot of money. But it would have taken a lot of money to actually uh, build it. And somebody thought, before we make this massive investment, why don't we do a little, little experiment? Why don't we put somebody in a room, these customers who told us they would pay $10,000 for a speech-to-text translator, put them in a room with a screen, a microphone, and tell them that we have a prototype and let them test it for a few hours. So they did that, but in reality, they did something very clever. They hid in another room a stenographer. By the way, here are two stenographers. They're doing an amazing job because I have an accent and I speak fast. <laughs> so what was the, the thing that did? The stenographer obviously had, had a pair of headphones, and they implemented, uh, it looked to the users as if they had the perfect speech to text translator. So I thought, you know, this is an interesting idea, but it's not a prototype. It's not like they tried to miniaturize stenographers and put them in a box, right? You guys wouldn't want to be in a box. Uh, so I looked at this and I thought, well, this is a brilliant idea. It's not a prototype. And I came up, or Alberto came up with the word pretendotype, which was a really horrible uh, word, which later he shrank to the word pretotype. And uh, what happened with this idea testing, remember they haven't built anything, is that before people told them, yes, of course, we would want to buy a speech-to-text translator, but after using it for a few hours, your throat gets sore. Imagine working in cubicles with everybody dictating public, static, main, open parentheses. It just, uh, it just would not work. Uh, or dictating confidential, like fire James Whitaker. Uh, it, just, it just wouldn't work. So after they did this idea testing, they realized that most people told them, I thought I was going to buy, but I decided, no, we don't want to buy it. So imagine the, the amount of time and effort they saved. Um, one more example to drive the point home. Uh, some of you may have owned the original Palm uh, Pilot. The person who invented the Palm Pilot, Jeff Hawkins, was also the, the co-founder of Grid Computing, the, the, the company that tried to add the first uh, tablet or iPad-like computer. 
He had an innovator's nightmare. He spent years building the product, testing, and let me tell you, it looked beautiful. I wanted one. It was like $8,000, so I wasn't ready to, to pay. But it was beautifully designed, beautifully tested, and then nobody bought it. So they wasted years and tens of millions of dollars. So before doing his next company, Palm Pilot, he decided, before I build this thing, let me pretend that I've built it. He actually went and cut a little piece of wood and put some little paper sleeves and a toothpick, and he would go around for a few weeks, carrying and pretending, hey, James, are you free for lunch tomorrow? OK, pull, all right, so I make a note. He would put memos, phone numbers, et cetera, et cetera. So he pretended to have it and use it, and he discovered, you know, this form factor I would actually use. And of course, it has become the form factor for all the products, all the mobile phones that we own now. So why, why do you do this? You know, you know the good tests fail. A test, test that always passes is usually not a good test. And the same applies to testing ideas. And it has to fail fast. So with prototyping, what you do is you try to minimize the time you spend on an idea. Because if you spend too much time with it, you become too attached. So uh, imagine you have a product. You worked on it for three years. Even if you don't think it's going to work, how easy is it for you to say, ah, we just forget it. Let's stop. You don't do it. You know, in, American, in America, winners never quit. Quitters never win. So what do you do? You raise some more venture capital, and you go for a couple of more years before the product is actually killed. With prototyping, with idea testing, you spend a few days or weeks to do that. And then if the product turns out not to be the right one, you stop. Uh, you stop working on it. Now, a lot of people say, well, you're just describing prototypes. Uh, uh, you know, you just invented a new word. You say preto, I say proto. But there is a very important difference between the two. A this is what a prototype for the Palm Pilot would look like. You know, it would take weeks, months to build. You're trying to answer a question, can we build it? Will it work? Will the graffiti handwrite recognition uh, work? With the prototype, you try to come in much earlier in the game. You're trying to find out, will people actually use it uh, if we build it? Now. Why am I telling you all this? First of all, to, to give you one of the reasons behind this movement. We kind of know that we're going from the Old Test mentality to the New Test mentality. Most people are aware of that. Most people are not aware of why it's happening. And it's important to understand, because as we'll see, it will affect uh, your career. I'm not the only person doing this. How many people have heard of the Lean Startup movement? A handful. OK. The, other, the rest of you, I suggest you, suggest you go and buy, uh, and buy the book. The Lean Startup is the way that most startups are being funded and run these days. Gone are the days of saying, hey, here are 10 PowerPoint slides. Give me $10 million in two years. Uh, I go stealth and bring you a product. So uh, this is Eric Ries. He came up with the term Lean Startup. And I use the term prototype. He came up at the same time with another term he calls minimum viable product. But the idea of the two is the same, prototyping, is make sure you're building the right it before you're building it. Right. And that's why these things are happening. So let me give you an example of something built right. Uh, I saw this in a flight magazine. As you can see, it's uh, a few years ago. It's very well designed. It's licensed by Apple, which must have got a pretty penny. It has two speakers. It's in stereo. It is waterproof. Now, I don't know what kind of intestinal problem the inventor <laughs> of this thing had that he felt he needed a, a iPod with recharger and speakers next to his uh, toilet, but at some point he thought that it was a good idea, and he apparently found people to actually fund it and build it. I, I, I don't know how I would sell this. You know, uh, it's pretty hard to uh, explain. And yet, notice how well built it is, right? It's just they spent a lot of time testing, and it's not the right product. What about an example of the right it? Now, we all know Twitter, you know, especially in the early days, it was very flaky. It crashed. You know, in fact, the Twitter whale became almost as famous as Twitter itself, right, when you had an outage. But you know what? And this is an important lesson. I think this is probably the best example. Twitter is the right it. So even with all these problems, people keep using it, and they keep using it more. So if it's down, who cares? We'll come back, and it's up again. Twitter was built using these uh, ideas that we are discussing now. It is post-agile. Uh, they worried about scalability after they achieved uh, scalability. So there are two books if you care about prototyping and MVP. The first one is mine. It's, in fact, it's not a book. It's a prototype book. I actually print and staple it myself. <laughs> uh, I will sign an autograph copy for $20 in the lobby. No, just, 
Just kidding, it's $25. Uh, uh, or you can just print it, uh, download it, and print it yourself from uh, pretotapping.org. And the other one is a more formal book uh, by Eric Ries. Now, if you want to stay in this business, whether it's testing or other areas, you have to know about this because this is the direction that people are going. You're asking, who's following this new Tesla mentality? I don't see it in my company. Well, if that's the case, then maybe you, you know, your company may not stay around for much longer because these are the people that you have to worry about. The new generations of company. If you work for a well-established company, you think it will be invincible, it's never going to change. Uh, the truth is that things will change. And in fact, entrepreneurs are getting younger and uh, sloppier. They just put code, they throw it out, see what happens, and if it doesn't work, they pivot, which means they change the business plan. The emphasis has shifted for new companies from building it right, which used to be true, say, 10, 15 years ago, to let's make sure that we're building the right product. And clearly, clearly, this has to have implication for you guys. And that's my so what. Now, when I say test is dead, do not take it literally, right? Nietzsche didn't mean when he said that God is dead, that literally that somebody kind of and went and hacked him. But it's a change of attitude, a change uh, in belief. So do not take it literally, but take it very seriously. And I will give you four signs of the test apocalypse that I've noticed. The first one is hiring and recruiting of testers is way down. I used to know recruiters whose only job was to just hire testers. Matt, do you remember? We worked with some of those, right? They just hire testers. They specialize in QA. Well, they got out of the business because demand dried up dramatically. Uh, testers are being commoditized. Let's be frank. They were never treated as first-class citizens. Some people put good words to it, but uh, now it's even worse. They're completely replaceable. Uh, it's being offshore, outsourced. It's going, uh, it's going out, and sometimes it's outsourced to people who are not even tester, as we will learn later in the conference, I think, when James speaks. You know, we have the cloud to do the testing for us. Now, this is particularly scary, but also exciting for some of the people in this audience. There's been an exodus in test leadership. Well, we know what happened to Alberto. Uh, James is doing ver very different stuff these days. A lot of the people that I know that were some of the test luminaries are doing other stuff. And yet, where is the new blood? Where is the new James Whitaker? I don't see them. I see just a lot of aging people who used to write books and speak. And where is the new leadership? I think there may be some of you in here, but you need a kick swift in the pants. And you know, I'm a very good motivator. So. Um, uh, we'll talk about that in a second. And finally, I see more and more companies shifting to this fragile, post-agile testing. And they're fully aware that they're not paying enough attention to testing. They're fully aware that they're going to put stuff out before their time, and they don't care because they want to make sure that they catch idea bugs before they catch uh, product bugs. So what does this mean for us, right? There are career dangers. Now, if you're an old-fashioned QA tester, or even if you're working on test automation and building framework, uh, you still may find employment, but it's going to be very hard to find employment in the hot new companies. I think 10 years ago, if you find a hot startup, they would hire test automation people, they would hire QA people. Right now, it's much harder. They just don't want testing the way that they use once. So uh, you have to keep your eyes wide, wide, open. As I said, don't take it literally, but do take it seriously. Uh, and the road ahead of us is wide open. It's full of potholes. And as uh, James so poetically put, you know, uh, the future is cloudy with a chance of test. You know, this would be a great photo. So <laughs> come on. There you go. The future is cloudy. All right. I just, what a poser. Yeah. The future is cloudy with the chance of test. It's a sub-theme of this conference. Here's the road. And I really see it like this. Uh, you know, it doesn't look very inviting right now, but it's wide open. The old leadership, it's either dying or you know, on their way out. There are huge opportunities, not only for new bloods, 
but for new models of testing. Right? So we went from the way you tested the waterfall, we went through this agile period that some companies do well, most companies do not do well. They just use it as an excuse to say, oh, we, we don't have tests or QA, you know, we do agile. And then they don't actually do it very well. So the road is wide open because the truth is that at some point, it, once you find that you have the right it, you will need ways to test it. And companies that found the right it by moving very quickly and uh, sloppily and carelessly are not going to slow down once they find it. They will continue to move very fast. Even at Google, we have some products that we launch every week, some of them more often. So from my point of view, there is a gigantic opportunity for the people here that have the passion and energy in testing to become the new leaders, not just as personality, but also in terms of developing a new philosophy of testing. Just like in regular philosophy, you go from you know, the, the empiricist to the existentialist to the you know, postmodernist, whatever it is, the same happens in our business. The, the way we develop software has changed, so the way that we test software has to change. And right now, I don't know who the leaders are. Re literally, no names come to mind. And if you're interested in testing, which hopefully you are if you're at this conference, maybe the leader is among you. So with that, this I is the end. Wait. wait, wait, James, hey, James. Hey, no, stay, stay. You, 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 you stay. still have a few you more years. Yeah. You stay away from me. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That, that's enough. Okay. Okay, so the GR uh, has time for questions. So don't address them to Alberto, he's dead. And you are right, I'm a development director now, that's a secret that you just, um, uh, and, and there's a reason, uh, because I agree with Alberto, Test is dead. I purposefully didn't talk to him about this before his death, because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't just influenced by Alberto's bigger than life personality. Um, and, and I do agree that there's an opportunity here, and I'm not sure who's going to step up either, but I'm certainly stepping aside to allow people uh, to step up. So uh, questions for the GR. What's up? What's your name? My name is Ilya. Okay, hold on. I want to see. I, I don't know what you're going to pull out of there. <laughs> Thank you. Wait, wait. First, I want to make sure if it's... Oh, yeah, no, you're, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> so, uh, thanks. That was a great presentation. Thanks Thank you. So, uh, my question is, uh, you're you, what you describe is actually very well applicable to like startups, some ad hoc projects, like 20% uh, time projects. But what about, do you think this is uh, really applicable to like enterprise, great software, um, like large systems, medical devices? So do you want your uh, like uh, artificial heart be driven by something that uh, was tested in fragile process? Well, definitely I wouldn't want my artificial heart be being driven by anything that James tested. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> How no, Google so, tests artificial hearts. Uh, that's, a good, that's a good So, so that's good. Uh, it, it's going to take time for this transition. And, you know, there are some products where actually you cannot taste this, take this post-agile testing attitude. You know? yes, I would sir. hate to fight fly in a plane where said, oh, good, welcome to our new 777. We're just flying with the new release, <laughs> 10.43.456 6 alpha. Uh, so uh, I, I try to be careful. There still are some industries and some companies where the traditional way of testing is what dominates. But those are shrinking. And for those of you who actually don't want to work for, say, Boeing or you know, Pfizer Pharmaceutical, if you want to work in startups, you really have to be uh, aware of this. Yes, there are products where testing will continue to be very systematic. But I would say all the new exciting products, if you look at the market cap of the largest companies in the last few years, a lot of them have been, you know, came up uh, this way. Even Google, I was at Google in the early days. I, I can guarantee you, we had 200 developers and three testers. So uh, very, very good question. There is still some job safety in the old uh, test mentality. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, as an Aurora, I'm with Oracle. So a question, what do you think about the future of, of quality assurance in the US now everybody is offshoring? 
Yeah, so th this is a very good question. The future of quality assurance in the US. As I mentioned, I know that recruiters, and I know because they call me all the time, they want to sell me, people say, hey, I have a great person here. The ones that were working in testing are pretty much uh, disappearing. So if you're a great, let's say, traditional QA person, you're one of the best, and it's your passion, you will, you will have safety, I would say, easily for the 10 or 20 years. But it's not going to be in some of the most uh, exciting company. Now, if you're not one of the best, if you're just a tester, you're being commoditized, commoditized, right? And we've, we've seen it in companies, and again, I'm not going to name names, where they've taken you know, 300 testers that work for the company, let them go, and replace them with offshoring to do black box uh, testing. So the future, there's definitely a lot of uh, clouds there. So once you've found the right it, or you think you have, and you've built it uh, fragile, sloppy, um, and you're actually trying to allow it to scale and actually make a real uh, sustainable product, what do you think the role of quality there in building it right is? So the question is, once you've found the right it, how do you build it right? I think one of the biggest mistakes that we make in our industry is to conflate the, the first phase, are you working on the right product with building it right afterwards? You know, we take code that was designed to be a prototype, and then we say it's successful, and we keep slapping more onto that code, and what happens there, you have this gigantic, I think it's called uh, technical debt. Is, is that the name yeah. they use? Yeah, yeah. or code debt. So, uh, again, I'm not gonna name, name names, but some of the most influential companies, they, they went through these periods where it became intolerable to stand on the, on the old code base, code, code base, so they went through this very painful transition to the new code uh, uh, base. So, first lesson is make sure that you're clear. This is the right it. You know, it's successful. We scaled to 10,000 people. To go to a million people, we need a different environment. But what's not going to change is that people that have learned to do this fast iteration, even if they re-architect the system for the new way, they're not going to slow down. So anybody that's involved in testing, they're going to hate you if you slow them down in any way, and the testers of the future are going to be successful if they actually allow them to keep their speed, or in the best case, accelerate the pace uh, of development. So, so I want to underscore that, because the, when I made the transition from test to dev in July, first we, we took on two things, right? I looked at this project and I thought, testing, all it's going to do is create more bug debt. It's not going to help us at all. The two things that I did was remove the existing technical debt and that was a development issue, right? There's a lot of refactoring and redevelopment that needed to be done. Higher quality, zero test. And then the second thing I did was get a faster release cycle so that I could get my product to the crowd, right? Real users doing real testing faster. And well, you, so heard, you heard James Whitaker. Lots of quality, no testing. The, don't worry, I can get close. No, I'm, you're not in danger, you're, you're fine. Just, just cut the salt, okay? You scare me. Cut the salt. Cut the salt? Okay. Cut the salt, yeah. <laughs> so you heard James. A person whom I, I call. I can finally understand you now that I can see what you're yeah. saying. <laughs> For the first time in years. Anyhow, continue. Uh, yes. The, um, you heard James, a person I called in previous GTACs, the Octomom of test book publishing, uh, say zero test. Now, if this is not a sign of the test apocalypse, I don't know what else, <laughs> uh, what else is. But he mentioned something very important, which I, I was hoping somebody would ask that question, but uh, it was a follow-on to your question. It's not the testing has gone. The cloud allows us to do the testing with a fraction of our users. You have a new release, uh, you launch it to 1% of the users, and if things don't blow up, you just uh, push it. You, you had a very interesting metric that we shared yesterday about the 200 bucks. Do you want to do it now or save it for your presentation? <laughs> yeah, I better save that one for later. You, but, uh, so, but seriously, that, uh, there is... Um, we're spreading test out over a larger population. I, I see test moving into development and into the user community. So there's that middle clump that we've been doing for so long. I mean, literally, if you would have been able to take a software tester from 1970 and move them forward in time to, say, 2010, they wouldn't have had to learn anything new to test. That's a problem. That's right? The lack that's of right. innovation. We're not, we, have, we have people like me and you know, other people who talk about, say, for example, exploratory testing. You know, there's nothing in this book that we didn't know in 1970. 
testing has kind of been stagnant for decades. We're just better at explaining it because we've had more time to think about it. Yeah, you can take most testing books and recycle them into adult diapers. I think that's, uh, <laughs> that would be a, 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 a good use. Um, so another interesting way that you mentioned it, which I hadn't thought about it, is you, test, traditional testing is caught in the middle, right? Yeah. The developers do some of their automated unit tests, and they, then we let the user you know, use the feature and tell us what is broken before we launch it to a larger audience. And so testers really, traditional testers, are caught in the middle, and that's not a good place, not a good place. Uh, to be. So when I, when I introduced my team, my new uh, Google Plus API team, we all sat around and we said, okay, this is our new project, this is what we're doing. And they looked at me and said, well, where are our testers? And that, it struck me that they were looking for their crutch. You know, they were looking for the thing that would allow them to continue to write crappy software. And when they found out that they were both the developers and the testers, they wrote better software. Absolutely. So how many think that this is a disheartening message? Just a, a few. Be all right. honest. Be honest. Well, yeah. All, all right. So no, the, the good news is it's a minority, and it's fine. For, for, for a small number of people, you know, maybe even 20, 30 percent, actually, it's not a small number, a lot of people, the traditional way of testing will continue. But think about, I don't want to get too philosophical on you, right? But when somebody says things like, God is dead, some people took it, oh my God, where are we going to get our morality? What's going to happen? Uh, but on the other hand, think about it. This opens the road for creating our own way of thinking, our own morality, and come up with something entirely new, which should be an extremely exciting thing. So as I said, the leaders are moving out. You know, the old guard is moving out. The old ways of developing are gone. There is a huge opportunity for people here that have the energy, the enthusiasm, the passion to come up with something extremely new. And you know, if you are lucky, you could be <clears throat> the next James Whitaker. Uh, no, my bad example. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, hopefully, is there anybody here that would love for that to happen? You know, there have to be some new ideas and new ways of approaching. Testing. Any suggestions from this audience? Yes. Oh, he's waiting for the mic. And while the mic gets there, this is the opening keynote. Uh, well, first of all, because I would I, 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 uh, agree to do nothing but the opening keynote, but also because this is the theme of the conference, right? If test is dead, there's cloud on the horizons. What are we going to do about it? When you sit at those tables, that's what you should be thinking about. So, so exactly. Sometimes you think, you know, so testing is dead. Probably you guys need to look for another job. Uh, and my comment on this is uh, we really need to reinvent ourselves. W where I work, I hate the word testers because I think we're really quality people, and quality should be implemented all across uh, the development life cycle. So we just need to reinvent ourselves and stop calling ourselves as, as testers. We're just like process monitors. We're quality people. We, we, really need to, we really need to put quality in every step of the development life cycle. So by the time the, c the code gets to us, which is uh, the QA phase, uh, like James just said, uh, it doesn't need testing. Or we hope it doesn't. But uh, again, for everyone, you know, it's not testing what we do, it's quality assurance. And we really need to make sure, monitor it, and have it implemented all across. Uh, that's just my comment. Agree? Disagree? <laughs> well, I agree, so I'll agree, and then we have two more questions. In fact, if, let, let's make up a term right now to replace testing, testers. Let's call them writers, as in not the ones who write, like m making things right. So here's how a writer, and this is a horrible name, so I have a horrible name, so you can come up with a good name. The job of, of a writer, somebody who set things right, is not necessarily to do testing. As James described, one of the tools for a writer is to make sure that your company has the right product quality-wise and in other ways. So the right tool may be, you know, instead of testing it in-house, let's send it to 1% of our users and see what happens. Someone in that role, somebody needs to own that role, right? Because companies also do that very sloppily. So the job of a writer is to take into account, all right, we have unit tests, automated testing, offshore QA, but one of the tools that we have in our arsenal is actual, the actual public, the actual end users, and find ways to use the users to make sure that you have the right product. So it's even beyond quality, right? Quality also is a little bit tainted. You want to make sure, move from testing, from, you know, finding the bugs to make sure that you have the right products and the right fe features and, they, and that they work right, using whatever means are available to you, and you're stupid if you don't use the users that you have available to do that. 
for you. So excellent. One, one question here, and then I, I saw a hand there. Yes, sir. Can we take like one question, then two more, and then we have yep. a little then, then we'll break. Be uh, Troy Thomas, Ultimate Software. Um, so great presentation. Ultimate? Ultimate I, I don't software. know. The... What's that? I don't like people using Ultimate. Only oh, I'm okay. Ultimate. OK, right. but we that's can, OK. We can talk after. <laughs> Um, so, so one of the questions I get asked pr pretty much daily, um, let's assume we build the right thing. Um, we meet and exceed expectations of users or customers. The question I get asked uh, consistently is, do we focus more on unit tests, GUI tests, exploratory testing? How do we achieve or increase quality? People are always saying, how do we achieve quality overall? With the assumption that we are building the right thing. So. Can you, can you address that? How do we achieve quality taking the assumption of we exploratory test, we unit test, or do we ask the question of do we GUI test more, do we GUI test less, do we focus on unit testing, do we focus on exploratory? So how do we, how do we address I, that? I would say you know, testing along with quali quality is a word, I would almost take it out of your vocabulary, because let's face it, those words are tainted. Uh, they, they're tainted themselves. The practitioners of those words are tainted. You want to reduce your salary by 20, 30%, call yourself a tester or say that you work in QA, right? So uh, with, with that understanding, the, the focus should not be on quality, should be in making sure that you're building the right it and that the future, future features are what people actually need. So when you ask me, should I focus more on unit testing or GUI testing, you focus on where the problems are. What is going to make your product less right and less competitive uh, with the rest? So there isn't a clear answer because, you know, for Twitter, uh, you know, the GUI is pretty simple, so there isn't much work there. So they would probably focus on scalability and reliability testing. If you do tax software, then you better have the right uh, answers. But again, try not to use the word quality or testing, because I found out that they're tainted. You know, they're, they're, they, they sound boring. Quality sounds really old-fashioned, and testing will lower your salary by 30%, and it doesn't get enough respect. But if you go and you tell your company, Hi, my job, I'm a, a writer, or I, whatever name we come up with, right? Uh, my job is I will make sure that whatever we put out by any means available to me, users, whatever, it is the right product, that people like to use it and will continue to use it, and that will depend on what kind of product it is. It's complicated, right? We cannot address it here in 10 minutes, but I hope you guys will develop. One question there, and then one more hand, and then we're done. Uh, I am from HCL, uh, so I pr primarily agree with what you had said till now, because uh, we actually have seen a change of shift wherein we have found the web development projects which we get, they are suggesting for having a JUnit Selenium mix framework which will probably test with the development cycle itself. Uh, this was uh, starting from a couple of years back till about six months back. Last six months we are seeing an interesting trend companies which are having a very stable unit testing framework are today asking us to do some kind of exploratory or a manual testing on the end application. And that's outsourcing to India. So oh, oh, how does this relate to the whole picture? Pe uh, uh, customers who have already moved to the new uh, post agile, they are today coming back to us with like kind of a tester service model where they would like to testing a service model when they would like probably for every testing some amount of manual exploratory some something like that kind of testing they are coming back to us so how does that fit in the whole picture well I, actually so the question is if i tell me if i understood it uh, correctly companies that practice post agile in the last six months i've started coming to you and say can, can you test the whole thing the product yes exploratory yes, yes. they are kind of doing a, they asking us to do a regression cycle but not have any kind of automation or anything. They're more looking at manual, exploratory, and that kind of a system. Yeah, so that's that actually very consistent with the message that I meant about testing being commoditized, right? Uh, you, you, you work for a company that does this. You're not part of the company, right? And you're yes. not in the US. Yes. That's right. So uh, that's exactly the message. The companies realize, well, we need to do some kind of testing because testing is important. And a, writist, a, a, a writer, uh, that's a horrible name, may decide to actually uh, do that, that in addition to you doing some user testing, maybe if the product, they're very unsure, they will go to a company like yours and say, please bang on it manually before we put it uh, to the public. So I would say it's entirely consistent with this technical debt that I've seen people accumulate. And they want somebody to, you know, to 
go and look things over before launching. OK, one more final questions there. So one possible way of uh, getting early testing of the idea that you mentioned is testing, releasing it to 1% of the users or targeted users. In the current generation with the electronic media so powerful, what, there is a huge risk that you might get a lot of criticism and negative publicity to the product even before it's fully baked. How do you mitigate that? Good. that there is a risk that you, sorry, I didn't hear it very well. There are blogs which go out and uh, might create negative publicity oh. of the product before it's even fully baked. Very good. How, yeah, yeah. So the question is, it? what if you do this fast development, you launch product, you send it out, and it doesn't work, so let's say it crashes or it has the wrong functionality before it's fully baked. That is clearly a risk. If you read books like Preto Tapping and The Lean Startup, you will find out that you actually, the stupidest thing that a company could do is to launch uh, ahead of time to a huge audience. So you do it on a smaller scale and you see if there is traction. And you do that for two reasons. One of them to avoid this huge global embarrassment when people think that the product is ready. But more importantly, you do to make sure that it's the right product. Now, having said that, I know of companies that they had horrific launches where the product crashed uh, and didn't work or had all kind of security issues, but it was so much the right product that people stuck with them through that particular uh, phase. So in summary, the stupidest thing you can do is not test at all and launch it globally, you know, take a full page ad on the Wall Street Journal uh, and say, hi, the product is ready. So that's not what prototyping advocates. That's not what Lean Startup advocates. In fact, it, it says start with small groups, see if the feedback is worth it, and then before you go and put a full page ad on the Wall Street Journal, make sure that you have the right it, which you will have done before, and then at that point you want to test that it works at least uh, well. But having said that, a lot of companies had those huge launches, they crashed, and people kept coming uh, back. Users, would you agree, users are becoming more tolerant of failures because they know that they can hit reload or come back an hour later, which is, uh, you know, just we're becoming more sloppy and the users are becoming more forgiving. So with that, I want to make sure I leave enough time for the transition. It's been a pleasure. Uh, send your good wishes to Alberto and thank you for coming. Enjoy the conference.